Thank you. And it's a very, very big pleasure to join you all. And we did a fantastic tech switch there and it's still working. So I'm celebrating. I'm sorry John Erickson has uh, been caught by the COVID bug, but he's still with us. So yes, let's celebrate tech because it means I can be in the room with you. Uh, so I'm sitting in, in London. It's actually sunny. That's, that's rare. And I'm thrilled to be joining you. So I am going to share my slides. I've got a lot I want to share because, yes, we are going to do a deeper dive in what does it mean to bring the donut to a place. And I just want to start by picking up on what John Erickson just shared, because, you know, Vermont has always been ahead on this. The, the genuine prosperity index is a massive pioneer. So it's a very big honor that you're saying, oh, we now want to try what does this mean with the donut? So it's a lovely, long story. And I feel the presence of Herman Daly, who, let's remember, passed away almost exactly one year ago. Uh, it's his story that we are continuing to play out. So this is not my donut. This is everybody's donut. And we will go past it and through it with places like yours, putting this into practice. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's go. And we're going to dive into exploring what does it mean to put the donut into practice in a place. I'm going to sh I'm, I'm sharing a lot of concept, a lot of slides with you, but it's one concept that I'm just going to show you from so many angles until you can't resist getting tucked in. So here is the 20th century vision of progress. We know this too well. GDP, it has not taken us to a place we need to go. It's time to move beyond. You have the GPI for many decades. Let's also try out the donut as a compass, or as you're talking about a steering wheel, a compass for 21st century prosperity. The goal, leave no one in the hole falling short on the essentials of life. Don't overshoot the life supporting systems of our planet. It couldn't be simpler, but of course it is challenging. We have brought together here, as John Erickson just said, the SDGs for the social foundation and the planetary boundaries for the ecological ceiling. So we're putting together the, the world's government's agreement that nobody should be left in the hole and the latest uh, earth system science of what is our relationship to the whole planet and the challenges of course we are massively overshooting multiple planetary boundaries while worldwide billions of people fall short on their most essential needs many of them living in low-income countries but i bet you could walk into high streets in vermont i could walk out into london and find people living in deep deprivation here too this is a global picture and of course we need to look at national difference. So let's come down one level from the globe to the nation. Four very, very different nations. Malawi, massive human shortfall, not overshooting their share of planetary pressure. China, double whammy challenge of human shortfall and ecological overshoot. France, overshoot. The US, very significant overshoot. Now, every one of these countries has people living in deprivation. But we can see that as countries get richer, the ecological overshoot increases. So there's no country here that has the right to call itself developed. In fact, there's no country in the world that is meeting the needs of all its people within the means of the planet. So I, I invite every one of us to, when we hear ourselves saying developed countries or advanced nations, like, hmm, where did I think I was talking about? Because we need to rethink that. So at the level of nations is one journey, but let's come down another level. Let's today focus on the level of the state. What would it mean to say our state within our nation, within the world, wants to live within the donut? What would it look like to set out on that journey? And let me start with a spoiler that I don't think any one place can live in the donut unless the rest of the world is well on the way there too. This is a collective achievement. It's not them versus us. We've made it, you've got left behind because we are so interconnected with the entire world. We, we must move together. But places can, of course, be pioneers in setting that ambition and in demonstrating to everybody else what that can look like. And that's why ever since I first drew the donut over 10 years ago now, I was very quickly approached by mayors, by councillors who said, could we do this here? Could we take that idea and do it locally? And those are the pioneers we love to run with, which is why I'm with you right now. And we call this the portrait of a place. How do we unroll this donut and really go into the detail of a local and global connection. So when we create the portrait of place, here's the principles we're following. 
we aim for it to be locally relevant rather than comparable be between places. I just showed you Malawi, China, France, the US. That was done with global top-down comparable data sets so you can actually compare one country against another. This takes another approach. This says we're going to let go of comparability between countries and states. We're going to focus on what's most relevant to us here, what's available to us here. So it's a bespoke portrait of place. It takes the long view. This is not about next year's election. This takes the long view. This is 21st century compass. And it focuses on creating boundaries that sh show our desired outcomes, the target of where we want to be versus our current performance. And all these examples you can see, they're just different places, different ways of doing it. The, over the overarching results does not tell us everything. It's a holistic snapshot. So we have to select out a few indicators that we say these serve as a snapshot for an inevitably much, much richer picture. And it creates an opportunity for tracking progress over time, right? You can see if we're in overshoot or shortfall, are we moving in the right direction? And how do we accelerate our progress towards getting there? And it invites us powerfully to combine official data with community sensing, which I want to share with you. So in that spirit of what we're creating when we are creating a portrait of place, we first start by unrolling the donut. We need to make some space here, right? We open it up between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling, and you can see there's a tiny question. It's actually a very big question, so let's write it big. How can our state become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? That is one almighty big question, I know. So we need to break it down. And we break it down into what we call the four lenses. You can see on the left, there's local aspirations. And on the right, there's global responsibilities. In the bottom half, there's the social story. In the top half, there's the ecological story. So I'll just very quickly show you each of these. And then I'm going to come back and show each one again. So we start with Let's start where actually places nearly always start with the people of the place. How can everybody in our state thrive? The local social question. What would it mean for everyone here to live a good life? And let's ask the local ecological question. How can our state be as generous as the wildland next door? So we are continuing to create a healthy, thriving ecosystem here. These are the local aspirations. And when you are actually somewhere, this is what you immediately sense. I feel like people are leading thriving lives here. The air is clean, the forest is healthy, the water is clear, what's not to like? And that's why many people in the world, when you ask them where's the most sustainable place in the world, they'll say Norway, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, because those places feel great on these dimensions. But it's only half the story, right? We've also got to take account of our global responsibilities. We've got to recognize we're connected to the whole planet. So before I go to the whole planet, let me take you into these local aspirations. Oh, no, let's go. Let's go to the whole planet. So how can we respect the health of the whole planet? Now, this is the planetary boundaries. And let's just remember that we are connected through the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the laptops we're using right now, the phones we have. Our lives here draw on materials and energy from the whole world. And that's what makes thriving in your locality possible, but it also draws on people worldwide through global supply chains. We also have impacts on people worldwide. So we need to take account of all of these and the complexity of this. And I hope you're feeling it. Whoa, that's a lot. Yes, it is a lot. But if we ignore any bit of it, it don't, won't go away. It will just fail to be managed. And you can bet it's going to come back and hit us and undermine us. So we have to take it into account. This is what it means to do a portrait of place. So let's go into the four lenses. How can everyone in our state thrive? This is the local social. And you can see across the bottom the dimensions of this place. What does it mean for everybody in our state to have good food and clean water, good health care and education, housing, access to energy, connectivity and mobility, a strong community and thriving culture, income, equity? equity and the diversity of our identities, political voice, peace and justice. What are our targets for what that means and how are we doing against each one of these? That is inevitably a local conversation. 
Nobody can tell Vermont what it means to thrive in these dimensions other than Vermont. You set your own vision and you measure it yourself. How are we doing? Let's add to that the local ecological. How can our state be as generous as the wildland next door? This comes from the work of the brilliant biomimicry thinker, Janine Benyus. If Janine were in the room with you, she'd, she'd already be opening the door. Come on, guys, let's go outside, she'd say. Take me to the wildland next door. Show me the healthy, natural habitat of this place. And let's go and marvel at nature's generosity, because in every locality, nature cleanses the air. She houses biodiversity. She stores carbon. She cycles the water, harvests solar energy, regulates the temperature from the treetops to the forest floor, builds soil and makes us feel at home. How can we create cities and settlements and farms and villages that aim to be as generous as nature so that we start to mimic her generosity when we build cities, when we create farms? It's a, a wild aspiration, but it's also utterly natural. Can humanity create human settlements that actually belong as part of the generous systems in which they're embedded. So those are your locals, thriving people in a thriving place. And they're both specified locally by the people of the place, but also by the ecology of the place. And this is a beautiful invitation to people to go outdoors, take school kids out. Let's measure the generosity of our own habitat. How do we bring that aspiration into the way we redesign our settlements? Let's now go to the global and think about the connection. Think now, the, the clothes that you're all wearing in the room, the food you've already eaten today, the, all the digital equipment surrounding you, the carpets, the chairs, the glass, the building materials, they did not all come from the US. Much of it has been imported. So there's an energy and material footprint from the world into your very room and of course throughout your state. So how can the state respect the health of the whole planet and people worldwide? Let's just think about the food we eat, the clothing we wear, the electronics, the products, the construction materials. We know they have a global ecological footprint. And this is where we are putting pressure on planetary boundaries. When we are driving cars, we are emitting carbon emissions that impact climate change all over the world. But also the very cars we're driving have been mined from minerals and lithium batteries all over the world. So we have to take account of our whole global footprint. And it means that we're taking account of our carbon emissions and our material use, not just in terms of domestic production, but global consumption. And then let's add to this, the people who are affected worldwide. Now this is a more complex lens, the one that we actually usually think least about locally. So let's really lean into thinking about this. We impact on the lives of people worldwide through many, many different processes through those global supply chains, when we choose chocolate in the supermarket or tea, when we choose what clothes to buy, who stitched and sewed them and were they paid a living wage? Is it fair trade for what we're buying? How are our purchasing decisions affecting labor through global supply chains? We connect it to people worldwide through our lifestyle patterns. If we are flying everywhere, we are emitting carbon emissions that are impacting climate events today. We're affecting people through cultural connections, through universities that invite people from around the world, scholarships to build solidarity, through cities that have a sanctuary city or a, an international twinning, building solidarity through our cultural uh, abilities to empathize and have solidarity with others. How do we welcome migrants of, of, for whatever reason they are coming? What is the policy of welcome? And what is the culture of welcome here? And then let's recognize we are always connected to people through policy regimes, which often is happening at the national or international level. We may not be able to change it directly at the state or even local level, but we recognize that the nations in which we belong through trade rules, through finance rules, impact people worldwide. So those are the four lenses. And we invite you to bring them into account because Vermont has a unique story in every single one of them. Now, what we can do is bring data and targets to here. So for each one of those dimensions, you can literally ask with a little blue post-it note, what is our target? What are we aiming for? What would thriving look like here on this dimension of this lens? And is it ambitious enough? 
Are we actually setting ourselves climate-based or science-based targets? Are we setting ourselves targets for eliminating homelessness in our state? Why would we tolerate it? And then against those blue ones for the targets, we collect the orange ones for, and how are we doing? Are we collecting the data we need? Does it exist? And what kind of information does exist? How can we gather now information that will tell us the state of play? Now, here is an, is an ideal situation in which you'd have targets and data on every single one of those indicators and those dimensions. It's not going to be that way. This is much more a common pattern. Most places have a lot of data about their local social reality. That's what they collect most data on and have most targets on. Many places we found have very few targets on the local ecology of place and some data. So can you set targets for Vermont's ecology, local ecology thriving? And what data do you have? More places have some global ecological data because now we have climate footprints, carbon footprints, some material footprints, and a bit of data. And then most places have almost no data and targets on their global social impact. So I invite you to lean into these gaps. Don't just fall into the places that are already familiar and already full of data. Lean into the gaps because they matter too. I'm gonna quickly take you through what it means to create a rich portrait of place because there are many different kinds of information you can bring here. I focused on data, but it makes it sound like a very technical journey. And for those of you in the room who love data, go for it. But for those of you in the room who are not mad about data, this is your moment. Here are so many different layers that you can add to creating your portrait of place, your Vermont portrait. So it's got one portrait with many layers. Yes, I've just begun with targets and indicators. Gather the state data, draw on all that's already been collected. It can inform you a lot. You can focus on local strengths, just inviting people to highlight what are we already good at here? What's already in action? What are our values? What can we praise? What can we honor that we're already doing well? We need to gather that and steal ourselves for the challenges that still lie ahead because then we bring out the challenges. And this can just be sensing in the room. From those of you in the room, what are you sensing are the big strengths and the big challenges in each one of those four quadrants? Do you agree? What's a sense of the moment for Vermont? Questions. Some people ask fantastic questions. You could just ask, what do we mean by thriving? What would it look like to bring in the views of homeless people in our state? Whatever question you want to ask, what would it mean to be as generous as the forest next door? So you can layer into these questions. You can bring in history and stories. Why is our infrastructure like this? What are the colonial histories that have caused us to live like this, have cities like this, roads like that, regulations like this? Let's just recognize that today is an amalgamation of hundreds of years of decisions. Let's recognize where we've come from if that's a valuable story for you in creating a portrait. Experience and sense of place. You can literally go to different places in the state, go to a high street, go to the middle of the woods. What does it feel like here? What are our senses and our human experiences telling us about the quality of life here? And then bring dreams and bring possibilities and bring your imagination and everyone can do this and kids are fantastic for this. What can we take the long view of and imagine prosperity in Vermont. I'm a jazz singer, by the way. I'm often singing about moonlight in Vermont. So it's really lovely also to be talking about prosperity in Vermont. So yeah, bring your dreams and possibilities. So there you are, there's many possible layers that you can add into that portrait and make it as rich and expansive and continual process as you like. You can see the chances for community groups and schools year on year to get involved in telling Vermont's story over a decade. Here's just, now I'm gonna thrill you with examples from all around the world, uh, because this is happening, right? So here's just examples of community-led projects that are in so many different ways doing that journey, creating a portrait of their place, bringing together whoever wants to be in the room with whatever data we've got going out into the place and sensing it. So many rich ways of telling that story. Some places choose to put strategic topics like transport or housing or food 
in the middle of the four lenses and then look at that one topic through all four lenses and you'll very quickly find there's something to say everywhere. So it can also, once you've got your portrait, even better, but even from the, from the get-go, you can explore your place through a particular topic. We found that making these donuts and these local portraits really can empower local change makers. We're going to come together and they, in Amsterdam, they started calling it a donut deal. If there's a project that tackles at least three inside social foundation issues here and two outside environmental overshoots, that's a donut deal. Let's shake on it. We're going to make this happen. So it's been really mobilizing for people to use it in a very creative way. And of course, what they're often celebrating is lots and lots that's already in motion, that's already happening to say, we're already doing the donut. We didn't call it that, but it helps as an umbrella to bring it all together in this vision. You can do the data and measuring and monitoring as I was just showing, and you can do it either literally gathering the data or you see the picture at the bottom, there's uh, somebody putting stickers on, it's almost like a target board, inviting community members at open town halls, put on stickers. Where do you think we're having real problems? lovely way to catch the sense of a community about its place. In London, um, community members who joined the London Donut Economics Coalition, they just ground sourced their own London portrait. And I'm showing this one particularly to you now, because I, I see, you've actually got more resources in the room and more expertise than I know they were able to bring together. But just a few volunteers, they said, let's just go and see what we can do. And they put together the beginnings of portraits. So you can just build and build and build on initiatives by others that have already started here. Now, we've also been working with lots of city, local governments, um, district governments, town governments, unrolling the donut in around 70 places around the world already using this. So as well as community-led, city-led. A few examples, the city of Barcelona in Spain, they said, right, we're gonna really dive into this. You can see they've got the donut unrolled, they've got those four lenses, and they are asking themselves what kind of data, what kind of metrics, would tell us the story we want to tell about our portrait. They also did this during COVID, online, gathering post-it notes online. You can do wonderful online webinars gathering people's sense of, as well. Bad Nauheim in Germany, they selected 100 uh, residents locally from the city and created a, like a citizens assembly, gathering the local people's views on what it would mean to thrive in Bad Nauheim. And then they created this beautiful visualization to share back with the whole city. In uh, Nanaimo in Canada, in Grenoble in France, you can see they've taken it as a visualization of a compass or in Grenoble they've actually measured it and re-rolled it and now they're using it as a compass. And over time, are we making progress towards this or not? And then in places like Cornwall in the UK and valence Palma in France, they're turning it into a decision-making tool. So taking the donut and saying, let's look at local projects that are coming up. Is this a good project? Let's assess it against where we know we're falling short, where we know we're in overshoot. Would this project put us into a worse position or actually help tackle the problems we've already identified? So we're working at Donut Economics Action Lab with a group of town councils who say, we want to turn this into a decision tool. We're going to, of course, open source it and make it available to everybody for whom that would be useful. And let me finish here. I'm sure I'm going to finish early so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, there's a report that we produced that if anyone's really interested in seeing all the different ways that cities and regions are getting started, this wonderful report by my colleague Leonora documents it. And you can see there are nine different ways she's documented, starting with just taking initial steps, having a conversation, having a workshop, getting people thinking about this, to going on more of a journey. Let's gather the data. Let's use it to build or to assess our strategies to going in deeper, creating a long-term compass with this, using it as a decision-making tool, and even identifying what are the levers of change within our own organizations that we need to press on to unleash these possibilities. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of the donut unrolled, how you could unroll those four lenses, gather the data. You've got all those layers, very different ways of gathering portrait and different skills and community members can contribute. I've shown you examples from around the world. I hope that makes you just ready to go and show the world back what Vermont can do. I'll stop there. I look forward to any questions or conversation this raises. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you.
Ellen, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear All you. All right. Now. So Jude and I are going to have some mics in the room here. And um, we're going to take some questions. We've got a good 15, 20 minutes to talk to Kate directly. Excellent. Who has a question? Okay, coming over. Uh, Representative Tiff Bloomley yeah. from the Vermont State Legislature, Kate, on the uh, housing, housing General Committee. That no, does, no. Sorry? Now I serve on oh, right. appropriations. appropriations yeah. Right, even well, more powerful. Right well, there. No. Uh, relax. Yeah, I I know. Right. So so I um I sit on the Appropriations Committee as we've just learned, and I I guess I am. I, one of the things I've been wrestling with since I joined that committee is, uh, you know, how can something like this impact, like, what would a committee like that need to do? <clears throat> I mean, is are there things, are there questions that we can be asking right from the get-go? Are there inventories that we can be doing? Are there questions we ought to ask state um, agencies and departments that come to us? Um, that would that that would enable us to develop a budget that was um, more aligned in the ways that you're talking about. Thanks, Tiff. That's a great question. So, first of all, all the examples I just showed you are of places that are pioneering the use of the donut. And of course, you can imagine we're thrilled to see all these um, local governments pick it up and really want to use it. And they often come and say to us, you, you wouldn't believe how we're making decisions at the moment. Like, don't ask, don't ask to see. But whatever we can make here is going to be a more holistic and more grounded decision making tool. So we are inventing those tools as we're going. So everything I was showing you just now was ongoing tools that are being built, like uh, the decision making tools. Now, if you're saying, how could we use this in our, in our committee? I would love to put you directly in touch with my colleague, Leonora, who works with local governments. And, you know, can we learn from you? What kind of tool would be needed? And we can think, where's the interface between what you're needing, what your committee is needing, and what these tools can offer? Is there a way we can arrange the information on the page and open it up that, that just is a beautiful bridge into your committee's existing concerns and becomes useful to them? So I don't have something ready off the, off the bat, but um, we're finding that more and more committees and government teams and organizations are coming back and saying, this is really helping us. Yes, you're putting a lot of complex issues on the table, but at least they're on the table. And now we can see them all and we can start to see the interconnections and it's helping us break down the silos between our departments. It's helping us take a longer view and, and just do more holistic thinking. So I, I'm, I'm answering just like that. If, and if you want to be put in touch with my colleague, Leonore, I would love to connect you to her and we can see if we can take this conversation another level deeper to, to turn this into a tool that is useful in your committee. Thank Great. You, Thanks. Tiff has said yes. Hand went up. Fantastic. Let's connect. Uh, and I love the breaking down of silos. The reason why we're here today is to break down. I, I know we've siloed you into your tables. <laughs> For now, <laughs> temporarily. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? This is Kate. I mean, you know, to have an audience with Kate is is a real gift. So please, get, let's you uh, as best I'm over can. here. Yeah. Hey, Chad. Oh wait, Tiff gets an invite, a, a big introduction, and I'm just kidding. Ellen. It's totally fine. Which is way more powerful than appropriations. Well, no, 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 not that part. Um, hi, Kate. Thanks for zooming in here with us here in Vermont. Um, I, you know, ever since I heard about this concept, I'm really interested in how to involve most impacted people sort of in the from the very beginning, because I think I'll say as a legislator, and I'm sure Tiff would agree with me, we don't have enough impacted people in the room when we're making these decisions. And it seems to me that that is a critical first step. So can you just speak a little bit of how to be really intentional about that so we uh, paint the appropriate and correct portrait of Vermont or a local town for that matter, if they want to take this forward? Thank you. That is such a great question. So, um, it's interesting, when we first began, we began doing these four lens portraits back in 2019, long before we'd all heard of COVID. And the first places we did it, we were working with the C40 network of cities. And the first places we did it in the U in, and it was in the US was in Philadelphia and in Portland, Oregon. 
and it was interesting because in in Portland, you know what you know. There's some local political things for some for some reason they said we just would rather keep this to our our our, our members of our council, like representatives and civil servants. Just we'll keep it to the sort of members of the team in the room. And in Philadelphia, they said, no, we're going to invite in. And it wasn't directly the impacted people, but we're inviting in civil society who represents those communities. We want them in the room from the beginning. And it was just very interesting seeing the difference in those rooms. And of course, I think, I mean, I just thought it was much more powerful, the openness with which they were ready to start in Philadelphia, but the groundedness of that conversation. You had at least the civic organizations working every day with really underserved communities, homeless communities who are working at the front front line of deprivation. Because let's just recognize that the donut focuses on deprivation, right? You show up if you're falling short. It, it was intentionally designed that way. It's intentionally designed to, to make visible those who are most impacted uh, rather than showing averages or showing, it doesn't focus at the moment on showing lots of success. You can add that in, but what it really makes sure that you don't miss is deprivation because it asks for the shortfall. So it's absolutely asking, could we please identify who is not eating nutritious food? Who does not have decent housing? And it's inviting us to look at it by geography, by ethnicity, by religious background, by whatever is the relevant identity that is that is clearly showing up as a pattern here and why, right? So it's you could, for example, say we're going to disaggregate the data on the local social, we're going to disaggregate the data by whatever is a, a relevant gender or race or religion or age or geography or income, because that is going to show us the systematic patterns of our place. But you can also, as you saw in some of those photos, you could be workshopping this in town halls, in Saturday farmers markets. You could have, you remember the picture I showed of a, a man putting stickers, you know, what's going well, green dot. What's, what do you think is not going well here, red dot. You could just have that in farmers markets throughout the state and invite people who are there, or, you know, I've got to put it in farmers markets. Not everyone goes to farmers markets. You could have it in the really actually run down high streets or the towns of the state, invite people, go to places where people are, show us and take photographs and that becomes part of the data. So there are many, many ways that you can invite the opinions and that's what those many layers were aiming to do. You could of course also hold a citizens assembly and I wonder if there's a, well, I'm inventing this right now on the spot, it probably exists, but a citizens assembly of the voices that most need to be heard. So it's not, a representative across the whole state. It's actually of those whose voices are usually marginalized. Can we bring their voices, especially? And what do we hear when we hear, especially from them? Last thing I'll say is I hope that it's clear that this is engaging and can be fun and it's very visual. So it's important that it's also not intimidating to people. We can bring photos, you can bring stories so that everybody feels I have a place in this room and my story belongs there or my story belongs there and I want to connect these things. I've seen people be empowered by using this framework to make themselves and their lives visible in front of the state legislator, in front of the, the, the bureaucrats and the civil servants of the place. And I think there's a beautiful opportunity for you to demonstrate to the world how that could be done in Vermont. Hi there, Kate. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chad. I'm with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And um, you kind of touched on one thing. You just used the word fun to describe uh, this work. And um, I'm kind of curious, jumping from that one, is some examples or guidance on how to develop these principles of place. Um, I think in Vermont, we have a lot of examples of, of things that we've done already, our con state constitution, uh, the work, the pillars, the principles of the Vermont Council of Rural Development developed. I think we have a lot of things to point to, but I'm curious from your perspective, what are some examples or guidance that you have on what other parts of the world have, um, have approached? How are they approached developing these principles of place? Thanks. Can I just ask one more question? When you say these principles of place, I just want to make sure I understand exactly which bit you're pointing to. Are you talking about the targets that one might set or, or, or something else? 
kind of, uh, the 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 initial kind of um, framework in which you're kind of uh, developing those principles. I think you, it was on the second slide, um, uh, developing those targets, but also just like how we approach building those targets. Uh, what are the the things that are bringing us together? Okay, great. By the way, I really like a finance guy who quickly says fun, like you, you, you're, you're onto a good thing. <laughs> um, uh, so when we started with Amsterdam, which was one of the first cities that we actually started doing this, actually in Amsterdam, Portland and Philly, because these are the three cities we began with. The first thing we did, if I'm, if I'm following your question, uh, the first thing the teams did was to say, okay, what what principles or what targets or have we already laid down like do we have targets for food here do we have targets on housing what have we already said we want to be the vision of our place and we gathered up all those targets and in Amsterdam for example it quickly became clear they had targets on a zillion things but absolutely nothing about food and that was a revelation for them wow um, we really should develop a vision for food in Amsterdam and then the second question is, okay, we have all these targets. Wow, most of us didn't know them. They were, they were buried in 17 different strategies. It was quite helpful to bring them together. Where are the gaps? And are they adequate? Now, again, this could be something you could do with community, pairing this up with the last point, right? In what ways could you invite community conversations around targets? Now, setting targets can become, you know, uh, companies and governments love to set targets. We want to see action, of course. So we wouldn't want to put all of our energy into setting targets. We've got some fantastic targets, but we're too exhausted to actually act on it. You want the target and also you want the data, like how are we doing? And in the absence of the data, maybe, you know, sometimes the best thing is what do people sense? Do people think this is getting better or do people think this is getting worse? Great way to involve community as well, hear their voices. Uh, in Amsterdam, so I'm just going to go in a different, a different angle on the principles here. One of the things that the community are doing in Amsterdam is they said, we've decided to work with the pioneers, and now I'm coming to fun. We've decided to work with the pioneers, because rather than setting grand targets for everything, you know, everybody will live in good houses and have good food by 2050, and it's all desperately far away and feels disconnected from now. So in Amsterdam, they said, right, we're going to identify the pioneers. We actually want to focus on the outliers. So in housing, where are, where are the really great housing initiatives happening? Uh, in Amsterdam, it was around a community land trust. How did they do that? How did they set up cooperative housing? It's not easy in this city. So how did this pioneering outlier get going? And what's stopping this from becoming far more widespread? So it's about spread. So what I love about that is that you start not with a long vision of a future that we might never believe we're gonna reach, but rather you start with something that's already happening that we want to celebrate, that's got energy around it and say, how, how can this spread and scale? And so, um, and last one, fun. If you get kids involved, ask kids to draw their vision of life in the donut. They draw fabulous things. And if you could bring, literally bring children's interpretations, you know, if you held a meeting of the council of the, of the housing finance corporation, and on the wall were little donut diagrams drawn by school children who had written in it their vision of what a great home would offer to them and their community. I mean, just that beautiful sense of our community's aspirations are all around us. How do we deliver on that, given the powers and responsibilities that we hold? Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Kate. You got a little giggle. You probably can't hear. But when you said that we have all these targets, but people are too exhausted to do anything about it, there was a little... <laughs> in the room <laughs> that uh that's great um, i think we had drew had her hand up yeah. yeah okay here we go drew hi kate thank you so much this has been so lovely um my name is drew i've worked in and around state government in vermont for just about 10 years which is a lot less years thanks ellen than a lot of people in the room um, but it's long enough to have seen some other initiatives come into place, trying to set a common agenda for the state. What does it look like to agree on a certain set of metrics? How can we really hold ourselves accountable? What does it mean to be aligned from a community-based organization perspective, state government, state legislature? Just we're a small state. It seems really possible. And there have been lots of people who have been making moves 
that feel really um, aligned in spirit and intention to what you're presenting here. And so I'd love to hear just insights and reflections from you about what it takes to keep attention, um, to keep attention, basically, to keep collective attention on a common agenda that certainly can change over time. And I think it, it might be an extension of your last answer, just like how to keep things fun. But I'm just curious your perspective on that. That is a great question. You're making me want to see if I can very quickly open up uh, one more slide because there's uh, I'm, I'm going to share something. So the first thing I heard you saying, and, and I, I think you if you were saying it, you were saying it quite rightly, like we've seen things like this before, right? Mm -hmm. He, is is this a here we go and I, and I and I'm and let's ask this is this a here we go again oh it's just a we're reinventing the wheel but it's a donut shaped wheel this time and there is a real <laughs> there, there is a real risk a risk of that right so we at donut economics action lab we have a very strong uh principle in the way we work which is we have never once tried to lobby or pressure or convince anybody to use these tools because there's enough tools out there already and there's enough stuff out there already. And we only respond when people approach us saying, given what we know about our place and we know a lot about our place because we're embedded here, given what we know, given the conditions we see, given the needs of the world, we from here think that is a useful tool for us. So we only ever go where the energy is because we don't want to be pushing. So if after today's workshop, you have a good day, but you think, you know what, this isn't quite the right tool, then I fully encourage you to find another one. I've got zero desire to see people pushed into a tool. Or you might think this isn't quite the right tool yet because we need to adapt it and make it ours. Then we say, bring it on and please share back because if you needed to adapt it, maybe some other folks will need to as well. What did you learn? Let's share that back. That's why we're putting these tools in the commons and we just ask people to share back their adaptations because that's how we all learn together. But uh, I'll finish with a story. And I did find my slides that I want to show you. When we first developed this for Amsterdam, uh, the city of Amsterdam were very, very keen to create this. And then they quickly came back and they said, hmm, this is really ambitious. If we're actually going to bring Amsterdam in for donuts, we don't think we've got fit institutions because we've tried to do this kind of thing before and do we actually ever get there? So I'm going to quickly share again, if that's okay. Um, and I will go fast through these, but but I, I, I resisted sharing this immediately. Well, no, I share the one tool, but you've asked me the question. So I'm going to go down. We say, look, if you really want to transform your place, you need to think about the deep design of your place. So going here, here we are. The deep design of cities or states will determine your future possibilities. Whether you are pulled back into the old ways and you can ask what's holding us back? What about the design of our own legislature, our own institutions? I'm not talking about the design of the city and the streets. I'm talking about the design of our own organizations. What's holding us back and what is actually helping us move forward? And there are five traits, right? What's our purpose? What's our networks, our governance, our ownership and our finance? So what is the purpose of our organization, our city council, our state legislature. What is our shared vision? Do we have a shared vision? And do, do people share that? Are we pulled back by the old kind of, well, we've got to grow as a place or as town or a state, or actually are we focusing on thriving? What are our networks, our employees, our networks with our residents, our networks with businesses here and companies, our networks with those we are in trade with, our neighbors, are we building collaborative networks or are we caught in those old contracts that actually become extractive? What about governance? Who's in the room when decisions get made? Who has a seat at the table? As Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to be elected to the House of Representatives said, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, pull up a folding chair. Do you create folding chairs to bring those, the, those, the marginalized? Second question we were asked today from TIFF, right? The people whose voices are not normally in the room. How can they be part of governance? Is decision-making closed behind doors, even and siloed within your own teams? Or actually, are we bringing evidence base like a decision-making tool? Ownership. Let's talk about how things around here are owned. Uh, this was a really interesting one for me, actually, in the US, because it, it, it seemed, I remember in, in uh, Portland, they were like, 
well, ob but but I mean, everything's privatized. You know, the, the the housing is privatized. Obviously, well, actually, in Vienna, the vast majority of housing in Vienna is owned by the city and city-run co-ops because they recognize housing as a human right, not an investment asset. So, actually, who does own the land in Vermont? Who owns the city land? Who owns the farmland? Who owns the buildings? Because who owns them is going to profoundly shape by what that owner of them has as a vision for the future of them. Who owns the city legislature? Like who, who holds the keys to your government? And where is finance coming from? And therefore, what is where that finance is coming from, what is it after? Is it chasing low cost? Or is it actually you know, community wealth building? Is the finance mindset saying, where are our anchor institutions? Let's use the financial power of our anchor institutions to rebuild the local economy. So we have these five design traits and we, following up from when you've done your full end city portrait or your state portrait, I'm sure you'll want to say, let's dive into this. And you can just layer onto this, you know, from the state to the nation, to the world, what's holding us back. And let's identify all the things that are holding us back. What's already helping us move forward. Let's identify these. And what can we already act on because it's within our powers and what can we only act on when we act together? Here's examples from Amsterdam, from Ipo in Malaysia, Toronto, Barcelona. This workshop I love because when we're working with the policymakers, they say things like, you mean we're actually talking about this? Like this sits under every table and behind every conversation. We don't normally talk about this. We're gonna talk about it. We need to talk about the deep design of our institutions because changing that is going to unlock so much. Let me stop there. Wow. I'm so excited. <laughs> I love this stuff. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, my name is Jared Duval. I'm a member of uh, the Vermont Climate Council. And um, we, on the council, were responsible for writing Vermont's first climate action plan. And one of the questions... I have is that in that plan and a lot of the work that Vermont does in terms of meeting our climate responsibility, it is trying to do multiple things at once. Do our part to reduce pollution towards science-based targets, build climate resilience, adapt to a changing uh, climate. And, but oftentimes, even though we see those things interconnected and things that we, uh, where we need to have multiple ambitions, Sometimes we hear political leaders or others in the state who want to paint them as kind of a zero sum or in opposition to each other. Like if you want to do climate resilience or adaptation, we need to do less in terms of investment and focus on actually reducing our pollution. And given all of the wedges um, and issues that are in the donut, I imagine you come across this all the time when people kind of try to frame these multiple issues as an either or, or competing kind of a scarcity thinking versus an abundance of opportunity where we do multiple things together. And I'm just wondering if you can share with us some examples that you've seen around the world of how we move from that either or to the both and approach so that we can um, advance multiple important uh, measures at the same time rather than pitting them against each other. Oh, thank you. That's such a great question. And, and as you said, you know, it we're trying to cut our carbon emissions within science-based targets. We're also trying to adapt. You're trying to create jobs. You're trying to restore local nature. And of course, they are all interconnected. So as I was listening to you speak, I was thinking, oh, I would love to put Vermont's Climate Action Plan at the center of the four lenses, right? You've got all four. Put it at the center because it's going to be touching on all four. And you can... You, one could absolutely choose to look at it as, oh, well, we're either doing this, but it's having bad impacts there, and we're trading off this against that. Somebody could come at it with that conversation, and maybe they should be allowed to, right? You, you invite them to express their fears, their frustrations, what they see through the clashes that those four lenses could be stirring up. But then you say, stay a while. Can we flip that around? Can we ask ourselves, how could we cut our state carbon emissions at the speed and scale required in a way that does create local jobs, in a way that does improve local health, in a way that does restore local nature? 
and so you can use the the four lenses precisely to say what else could we do what else could this be connecting to and we are finding places using it for that so to to make visible both the fears of trade-off but also the potential of synergy and i'll just give you one example from amsterdam the the head of sustainability in amsterdam when she decided to use the donut concept at the heart of their circular strategy. She then used it to explain to the public, look, we need new houses in Amsterdam. We know there's a housing pressure, but if we just build more houses in the way that we've always built more houses, we will blow through our carbon budget. We will massively increase carbon emissions. We're supposed to be doing the opposite. We're supposed to be reducing. So we need to do these things at the same time. How? Do we provide more housing while reducing our carbon budget? And we're going to have to think differently because we need to do these together. That's what the donut imperative is. And that's why we need circularity. And that's why we are going to change the legislation and the regulations around buildings. Buildings now need to have material passports. The best buildings are ones that already exist. We're going to retrofit. We're going to be creative about finding more housing space in the city. By the way, we're going to delimit the scope of Airbnb because it's not just about building more houses. Let's ask who owns the housing. How is it being used? Is it in service of our city? How can we limit its, its use in other ways? How can we um, transform the regulations? And at first, when they started introducing new regulations to, on circularity around construction, the architects and the construction crews in Amsterdam grumbled oh, you know new legislation but they quickly then turned around and said actually we can do this and now that we're doing this we find ourselves at the forefront of circular building and design and our skills are going to be needed not only in Amsterdam but very quickly in Rotterdam and also not only in the Netherlands but in France and Germany and Belgium because everybody is going to follow this so you can you can use this framework around to turn it around and see the potential for synergy, but also use it to explain stories to people who don't work in this field and, and, and want to see a bigger picture of it. And I think you could do the same with food. So I would encourage you to put Vermont's Climate Action Plan at the center of the four lenses, tell those stories, tell the fears of trade-offs, and then turn that around and tell the possibility of the synergy. But last thing, it will probably lead to doing things in ways they've never done before, because in the past they have led to trade-off. So we need to do something new and different to, to create a new and different future. Thank you so much, Kate. At the end, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, unfortunately, Kate is going to have to whip off to yet another meeting. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you all so much for such great questions. And thank you, Kate, for being with us. Oh my gosh, such a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me zoom in. I'm really, really thrilled to be with you. And I can't wait to see what you do with it. And it's lovely to know there are so many friends and allies in the room. This is big team work. And I'm really yeah. thrilled that we're doing this together with so many organizations. You know, it, it's big team work. So I'm delighted to bring this little piece of the meal. Have a donut. Show us what you make with it, folks. Can't wait Thank to see. you. We will report back for sure. And we do have donuts here. We have cider donuts in the room. So. Wow. Okay. Have Thank a wonderful you. day. Bye-bye.